So my name is Bruce Knotts, and I have the honor to direct the Unitarian Universalist United Nations office. We help bring the values of liberal religion, tolerance, freedom, and human dignity to the discussion at the United Nations. Um, and never in recent memory have those values been as, so sorely needed. From 2000 to 2003, I was the regional refugee coordinator for West Africa, focusing on the Liberian and Sierra Leonean refugee crisis in that region. I have continued to follow the global refugee situation ever since. Today, it's the worst it's ever been since the Second World War, with 65 million people displaced from their homes. I actually had written 60 million, but it's the local, most recent estimate is 65. This massive migration has been caused by conflict and climate change. It's likely the situation will only get worse as time goes on. Uh, this evening or this afternoon, we'll take a look into history at the refugee crisis that was caused by the Nazi regime, which engulfed Europe, and forward to what we face today and in the future. Right now, only blocks away from us, there's an event at the UN General Assembly. It's a high-level summit to address the large movements of refugees and migrants with the aim of bringing together countries behind a more humane and coordinated approach. This is the first time the UN General Assembly has called for a summit at the heads of state of government and government on, a, on the large movements of refugees and migrants. And it is a historic opportunity to come up with a blueprint for a better international response. It is a watershed mo moment to strengthen governance of international migration and a unique opportunity for creating a more responsible, predictable system for responding to large movements of refugees and migrants. Also today, PBS is airing the documentary Defying the Nazis, The Sharps War. The film is an account of the daring rescue mission that occurred on the precipice of World War II. It tells the story of Wetzel and Martha Sharp, the Unitarian minister and his wife from Wellesley, Massachusetts, who left their children behind in the care of their parish and boldly committed to the multiple life-threatening missions in Europe. Over two dangerous years, they helped save hundreds of imperiled political dissidents and Jewish refugees fleeing the Nazi occupation of Europe. It seems like fate that their story will be told on the same day that these same human rights issues are being debated at the UN. Perhaps the Sharp story will inspire new action, at least that's our hope. Today you will hear from the Sharps, from the storytellers who brought their legacy into the light, and from their family and friends. You will also hear from the people in the heart of the refugee crisis today, people who work for justice and those who have experienced injustice. I hope that you'll be inspired as I am to go out and see how you can help. I would also like to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Ken Burns has been making films for more than 35 years. Since the Academy Award winning uh, nominated Brooklyn Bridge in 1981, Ken has gone on to direct and produce some of the most acclaimed historical documentaries ever made. In March 2009, David Zwarwick of the Baltimore Sun said, Burns is not only the greatest documentarian of the day, but also the most influential filmmaker, period. That includes feature filmmakers like George Lucas and St Steven Spielberg. I say that because Burns not only turned millions of persons into, onto history in, with his films, he showed us a new way of looking at our collective past and ourselves. The late historian uh, Stephen Ambrose said of his films, most Americans get their history from Ken Burns and more than that of, of any other source. 
Ken's film have won 13 Emmy Awards, two Oscar nominations, and in September 2008, at the News and Documentary Emmy Awards, Ken was honored with the, by the Academy for the Television and Arts and Sciences with a Lifetime Achievement Award. Ken's latest film is Defying the Nazi, The Sharps War. Please welcome Ken Burns. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm very happy that we have reached the last lap of a project that has uh, compelled my partner on this, Artemis Joukowsky, for almost 40 years, uh, an extraordinary labor of love. And I'll attempt to give you just a, a few minutes of setup for it tonight at 9 o'clock on Channel 13 uh, in this area. PBS will begin broadcasting nationwide as well, our film Defying the Nazis, The Sharps War. Uh, I've been involved for the last three years, I'm very happy to say. It's a different kind of project for me insofar as I was handed something that had already been shot and had been partially edited. The archives had been uh, assembled for the most part. Most of the people in the film had been tracked down and, and interviewed, and it was my job to as today is, uh, run the last lap of a baton race. This film is very much uh, the work and the heart of Artemis Joukowsky, who you'll meet afterwards after the clip. So I share the co-directorship with him, but it's really his film. Uh, he has spent most of his life uh, telling the story, and oh my goodness, what a story it is. Uh, because the 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 conversation, the panel afterwards, will not get into these sorts of details. Let me just set the stage for you. Um, when Artemis was in the ninth grade, that is to say when he was 14 years old, he was given an assignment at a school not too far from here uh, to write or interview someone who exhibited moral courage. Um, Artemis came home and told his mom this, and his mother for the very first time acknowledged an important I guess, family secret. She said, you should go talk to your grandmother. She did some cool things in World War II. Uh, at that point, uh, Artemis had, was dealing with a life-threatening uh, illness, a muscular um, problem that has afflicted him the rest of his life, though he has transcended that affliction with his characteristic joy and uh, poise and generosity to others. Uh, he formed a bond with his grandmother and began to dig in to this extraordinary story and what an extraordinary story it is. Artemis kept at it when his grandmother died uh, in the late 90s. He discovered in her basement 14 boxes full of documentation that helped sort of verify not only the story she had told him, but began to put together the first tentative pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that he would spend the remaining 17, 18 years uh, trying to put together. He also realized at that time, due to the generosity of many other filmmakers, that this was probably a documentary film, and Artemis began devoting a great deal of his attention and resources to trying to figure out how to tell that story. He hired private detectives to track down survivors. Uh, he delved into the archives of the Holocaust Museum here and Holocaust museums around the world. Uh, he found survivors, he spoke to them. Uh, he began to assemble a critical mass. Um, and when I came into the picture, I've known Artemis for decades and uh, count him as a good friend. He is a very special man, as you will discover very shortly. Uh, I was already well into a professional life that involved sort of juggling multiple projects at any given time, and I had been informally advising Artemis, meaning every year or so he might call me or I might bump into him at a college reunion. We both went to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, that hippie school it's called, um, and uh, both felt transformed by time we spent there with a an extraordinary teacher, a still photographer, and a social documentarian named Jerome Liebling, who passed away a few years ago, both of our mentors, and uh, really changed our lives, rearranged our molecules, and I don't certainly recognize the person who entered Hampshire College. And in any case, I was vaguely aware out of the corner of my eye that, that Artemis was involved in a project that seemed to be 
if I could remember what it was about, about his family or some such thing. And you have to understand that I have underneath my desk a, a U.S. postal basket with hundreds of DVDs from people who are certain that I will look at it right away and make a seven point. Um, nobody had the story of Artemis' grandparents, and oh, what a story it was. So finally, cut to three years ago, uh, Artemis sent a DVD of uh, the cut. He'd, he'd finished shooting it, and he'd hired editors, and he'd been supervising uh, a cut. And he sent it to me, and as uh, advised as a rough cut, and to me, I would say emphasis on the rough. Um, but there was also a diamond in that rough, because at its heart, as I look for in any film that I get involved in, it had to be a good story. Oh, what a good story this is. This is the story of Waitstill and Martha Sharp. He is a Unitarian Universalist minister living in Wellesley, Massachusetts, a comfortable, one assumes, middle-class life with two small kids. The biggest uh, sort of concern is what he's going to say on Sunday. In January of 1939, he gets a phone call. Within a month, he is dodging, uh, she, his wife is dodging Gestapo agents in Prague. He's visiting European uh, capitals laundering money. They're both writing in invisible ink. They're destroying documents in the uh, gas burner of their hotel's basement. They have completely rearranged their lives. And as Bruce said, have left their two small children, including Artemis's mother, in the care of the congregation and have gone off to ultimately save refugees, Jews, dissidents, and their children. It's, uh, it was a phenomenal story, and I first said, sure, let me help you, and I gave a few notes, and as that went on over the three years, the notes got more complex, the screenings got more frequent, and I sort of gravitated from being a, a kind of distant um, uh, advisor to being an executive producer to being a co-producer and finally with Artemis a co-director but I I do want to firmly say uh, that this is his film but one I have am as proud to have been involved in as any film I've, I've worked on uh, this story clearly resonates and I, I think my attraction to a good story in this case was that it resonated with a crisis today, but I, I can tell you that over the three years that we worked on it, uh, countless hours, countless screenings, after I'd put my two small daughters to bed uh, at the end of a long day of working on other projects or on the weekend when there was free times, my anxiety that this might be an orphan had kind of compelled me to give it more attention, and I believe now that I have screened this film. Um, trying to make it better more than any other film I've worked on. A lot of that has to do with it's an hour and a half in length and not 18 hours or 20 hours and some of the other projects that we've done. Uh, but because it required it, but because the subject needed it, and it required a kind of fine tuning, I, I, I sort of disrupted the structure. I slowed the pacing down at times. I moved things from the end of the film to the beginning. I was able and most fortunate to get Tom Hanks to read the voice of Wait Still Sharp, who you'll agree I think is a good person to represent this American, um, but it struck me on a lot of levels. One is this sense of resonance. You know, Ecclesiastes, something both uh, the Jewish faith and the Christian faith share in common, says that rhymes, and it was very clear once this film was done, after we pulled our head out of the dark editing room and looked around that we were, as Bruce suggested, in the midst of a refugee crisis, second only to that which beset the world uh, during and immediately after the Second World War. And so a good deal of what the Sharps speak to us about, about altruism, about moral courage, about a kind of selflessness and physical courage. They were in danger uh, almost all the time on their uh, two missions uh, together, first in Prague on the eve of the Second World War, and then after the war began when they had intended to be in Paris, found themselves in southern France, in Vichy France, dodging, once again, Gestapo agents, uh, dodging a repressive French regime in the service of an even more repressive Nazi uh, regime, trying to get people, human beings, out of uh, one of the greatest cataclysm 
in human history. This is also a story about sacrifice, and, uh, and, and this film, I think, asks over time and in its immediate moment uh, great existential questions. Throughout the film, you'll hear the sharp saying, you know, uh, anybody would have done this. Uh, but of course, no one, not everybody will do that. It takes some extraordinarily rare and um, incredibly inspiring individuals to do that. And that is certainly the case with Waitstall and Martha Sharp. Of course, sacrifice changes your own DNA, rearranges your own molecules, and makes it difficult for things ever to be the same. And so sacrifice occurs at a grand global scale. It, it, it occurs in the moments that you do, but it's also hugely destabilizing to a family. Uh, you can see that in the face of Artemis's mother, who appears in the film, who over the generations still until just recently was still hurt by the abandonment that uh, she experienced, she and her older brother experienced. In fact, it took one of the survivors brought together with Artemis's mom by his project to remind her that it was okay that you had the strength to be able to carry on so that uh, his parent, her parents could come and save me. It's, it's a very, very powerful uh, story. I also think, in a large way, this is a film about potentiality. That is to say, when we speak about the Holocaust, we speak about the figure six million. And over the decades, the notion of six million has developed a kind of uh, opacity. We can't see into it. It has no definition. The Holocaust Museum in Washington attempts to do this. They have a wonderful interpretive moment right at the beginning of your experience of that extraordinary museum. They say, in 1933, there were nine million Jews in Europe. Um, by 1945, two out of three were dead. That's like Lincoln saying four score and seven years. It's another way to make you think about six million and, and have it imprint perhaps a little bit differently. I think that this tiny story of the Sharps, significant as it is, is just a tiny little blip on the edge of the Holocaust, and yet it permits us access. The people that you see in our film, you hear no narrator, you hear only the voice of Waitstall and Martha Sharp. You see some talking heads, historians uh, of the Unitarian Church, historians of the Holocaust, but mostly you hear testimony of those people the Sharps were able to save. They are in their 80s and 90s, but you have to do me the favor, do Artemis the favor, of extending to them the understanding that you are listening to children recall the most basic and terrifying uh, memories of their childhood. And then you learn towards the end of the film what they've done with their lives. And that potentiality, uh, that they were given a chance to live out lives, that the rest of those six million, uh, people for whom we could not help, people for whom our film is dedicated to, represent that same kind of potentiality. And then all of a sudden, six million isn't some opaque figure, but actually f has flesh and bones on it. It has experience tied to it. It has uh, a realness, uh, almost like an amputated arm that you feel long after it's gone. Uh, and I hope that we never lose the feeling and the disturbance of what took place there. And it is possible. The poet William Blake said you could find the world in a grain of sand. It is possible to take um, this tiny architecture of the Sharps and begin to see in a bigger way uh, what took place. It, just as you can look at the shape of an atom and realize it, it looks exactly like our solar system and make some connection. So our film is an hour and a half. It will start at 9 o'clock tonight. But we thought we'd share with you uh, two clips uh, from the film. The first is from our introduction, an extended introduction that goes uh, for several minutes. And if it needs an introduction, then I have failed. Uh, and Artemis and I have failed uh, together. Um, and then we're going to jump ahead after their just harrowing uh, experiences, and I urge you to look at it tonight in Prague, that, that you can't believe this isn't fiction, that this isn't a John le Carré novel or an Alan First novel, but in fact a documentary film about things that actually happened and things that were actually said and done. Uh, but to go to their second mission in the spring of 40 when they found themselves, both of them, in southern France trying to figure out uh, different strategies to get people out. And so we leave you with these two extended clips, and then I know you'll enjoy uh, the conversation on the panel afterwards, and I'm 
so honored that Ruth Messenger is here, one of my heroes, and uh, that she will help uh, guide Artemis and, and the rest of us in a conversation. So thank you for your attention, and we'll now show these two clips. February 23rd, 1946. My darling Martha, I hope and assume this reaches you on your return from what must have been a very exacting but very successful expedition. I must say that I would like to begin having a home again. The kids don't show their feelings too much. I see nothing but men's things in my wardrobe. I smell no perfumes. I have been quite desperate at times. I want to go on for what there is left of life with you. Seven years ago tonight, we stepped off the train into Wilson Station, and all our world has been different ever since. Ever yours, wait still. and Waitstill shop left the comfort of a peaceful, small Massachusetts home in order to go into Europe on the verge of war. They were motivated from the beginning to go out there into the kingdom of hell and try to get some people out. It was the second Sunday night of 1939. I had done a full day's work at the church and decided to spend an evening in front of our fireplace. The telephone rang, and it was probably the most momentous telephone call that I ever received. Hello, wait still. I knew whose voice it was, the voice of my closest friend, Everett Baker. Would you and Martha come over to talk with me at our house here? Yes. He said, wait still, Martha. I am inviting you to undertake the first intervention against evil by the denomination to be started immediately overseas. My husband and I felt that something should be done. Refugees in the Sudetenland had been murdered, and people had been imprisoned and hurt. We had two small kids, including a very tiny daughter. I said, how many men have you offered this to? 17, he said. I said, do I understand they've all turned you down? Yes. They think a war is definitely coming and they don't want to be in danger. I reassured Martha, missionaries leave their children. I'm sure ours can be left in good hands. I want to go, but I won't go without you. I knew I would miss the children terribly but we would only be away for a few months. I was torn between my love and duty to my children and to my husband. As my wife Martha and I went home under the starry skies, we went home with a promise to do it.
the core belief of uh, movements like the Unitarian and Universalist movements, belief in freedom, freedom of thought, in the use of reason and tolerance of difference. It's a faith that very importantly stresses that the shape of human history, the future of history, is in human hands. A Unitarian minister with profound conviction, a woman who had been deeply committed all her life to social justice, two people very much aware of the world around them, were handed an incredible invitation, a very frightening invitation, a very demanding invitation because of its implications for their family and their church, but an enormous opportunity to actually change history. I had never felt at home in law school. I took my degree with lasting gratitude for its stern training in analytical and conceptual thinking. But all that time, I had felt a joy in the conducting of service, in work with children, in the friendship and purpose of the free church. After graduating from Harvard Law School, I found my true calling. Wastel Sharp was the kind of minister I wanted to be. That is, he wasn't just the minister of a parish church. He was a civic figure. He was interested in the community in which he worked. He was interested in world affairs. He was interested in the need for peace in the world. Reason and freedom are the guidelines for our reverence. We are working here at a new adventure the organization of a church under the governments of reason and freedom, with the democracy of the American town meeting as its form and spirit. My mother was Martha Sharp. Her family fully expected that when my mother was going to graduate from high school, she would enter the workforce, doing whatever she could to make money for the family. When she was accepted with a full scholarship to college, they threw all her belongings out the window and told her that she was no longer welcome. My high school yearbook calls me a good suffragist. They claim I am progressive and advanced. I do believe a woman's place is in the home, but only half the time. After graduating from Brown University, I became a social worker. She worked for about a year in Chicago at a settlement house with people from all kinds of different backgrounds. That was something that she really took to. I can just imagine her with this diversity of people. I think Martha and Waite still had a very compatible marriage. He thought she was quite unique, beautiful. Waitsta looked very handsome, with strong, muscular shoulders from building stone walls with his father. He had a beautiful, light sense of humor and a creative mind. A carelessly knotted tie and crushed felt hat gave a casual touch to what otherwise might have suggested a rather formal person. They had the same orientation toward life, the same beliefs, the same sense of, of obligation, of wanting to do things for others. One interesting case is that of the writer Leon Feuchtwanger. Leon Feuchtwanger had been a very successful German-Jewish writer. He had taken refuge to France also. He's a Jew, an anti-Nazi. So when the Germans uh, entered France, they, they really wanted to lay their hands on him. So Feuchtwanger was quite in jeopardy. The Germans, they had a list of particular German Jewish refugees whom they wanted to incarcerate. Fochtwanger was on that list. The clock was ticking. And since he's German, he is put in a concentration camp, in a French concentration camp. 
People had appealed to Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of the president, to have this very famed author brought to the United States. It had to be done very quickly before the French turned them over to the Germans. And so a certain man in the American consulate actually went out by himself in a diplomatic car to that French camp outside of the city of Nîmes. They stole him out of the camp and they brought him to Marseille. He was spirited out and hidden first in the villa of Hiram Bingham. Now the, the problem was to get him out of France. The French police was looking for him. In the early morning darkness, I boarded the train with a group of endangered intellectuals, including Voigtwanger and his wife, Marta. And we began our escape. We were on the train for only a half hour when a man knocked on the door to our compartment. I stepped outside and he said, Mr. Sharp, you and your party must get off at the next stop. This train is going to be searched by French agents. I did not know how he knew my name. I had to assume he was an operative sent by the U.S. consulate. For the next few minutes, as we neared Narbonne, I faced the most difficult decision of my life because I figured that this might be a trap. But in times of war, you have to trust some people. The operative said that Vichy French agents, acting at the behest of the Nazis, knew that we were headed towards the border. I had to take responsibility in the next few minutes and decide what to do. I went down the length of the train and quietly informed the group that we would be getting off at the next stop. I instructed them to scatter when we disembarked as though we were tourists visiting Narbonne. This was very important. We would have to hide out for several hours until we could catch the next train. We stepped off the train and I stayed with Voigtwanger, the most wanted man in the group. We nervously strolled through Narbonne. The hours finally passed and the group boarded the next train to our destination. I was surprised to see the agent again. He gave more instructions to disembark at Cerbert where the group would rest for the night. I was also told to visit Dr. Otto Meyerhoff, a Jewish Nobel Prize winning biochemist who was hiding out in a small coastal village north of Cerbert. He was in a desperate state, convinced that he would be captured by the Nazis. As we walked along the beach, I begged him to join our party. He would not commit. If you didn't have that French exit visa, really the way to get out of France was actually to walk on foot over the mountains. They used a route that smugglers had used. We were ready to make our escape. This was a complicated mission, and I was not alone. It was a collaborative effort with Varian Fry's Emergency Rescue Committee and Leon Ball, a brave American who helped guide refugees across the border. We took the group to the start of the smuggler's path, and the order of events was this. Those crossing would depart in half-hour increments. The least likely to be recognized would go first, carrying cigarettes and money to bribe the border guards. I would take all their luggage by train, planning to meet them on the other side of the border. This is an extremely taxing climb. The mountains are unforgiving. This is no man's land between France and Spain. And I was not certain if they would encounter armed guards or no one at all. But the charm of cigarettes and money held fast and the border guards stayed corrupted. The group made it through and we assembled at a rail station on the Spanish side of the border, waiting for the train to Madrid. Four hours later, we arrived in Madrid, where we could catch a train to Lisbon to make our final journey across the Atlantic. Leon Voigtwanger came home in the lower berth of my little stateroom, which was to have been occupied by Martha Sharp. 
The first evening on the boat, he looked at me and, smiling inquisitively, said, May I address you, sir, as though you were a character in one of my novels? Why are you here, doing what you are doing? How much are you paid? Is there a payoff here from some agency? I said, I'm not paid any salary at all. I think something frightful, in addition to what has befallen Europe, is going to befall now. I'm not a saint. I'm just as capable of the many sins of human nature as anyone else. But I believe that the will of God is to be interpreted by the liberty of the human spirit. Well, this is a surprising answer, he said. Do you get enough reward out of that? I said, yes, I do. Our lives, including my life and certainly my liberties, are in the hands of somebody. And I don't like to see guys get pushed around. Finally, we arrived in New York Harbor, steamed past the Statue of Liberty, and it had never meant as much to me as it did then. But my elation was short-lived. I knew that Martha was still in peril. How would I tell our children that their mother hadn't come home? This is the letter I received when I was eight years old. Hastings, I am sending you this letter by Clipper. I love you, and I miss you very much. Now I have some very important news for you. Here in France today, the children do not have enough food. I shall not return home with Dad. I must wait until I can make all the arrangements for the children. So I must give up seeing you until about your birthday. I send you my love and many kisses. Loving, mommy. I had chosen the welfare of children as my project for this tour of duty. Hundreds of families had appealed to send their children to the United States. That is how the Children's Immigration Project began. I felt I could not abandon them. If we could arrange for one group of children to leave, others would follow. It was my moral duty to lead the first group myself. My father went from consulate to consulate trying to get visas to go anywhere that was plausible. That's how he met Martha Shar, who saved my life. And my father said to Mrs. Sharp, oh, if you could just include my girls in the group of children to go to America. And she said, well, the group is full. And as it turned out, at the last minute, two boys who were going to go with the group did not show up. And so my sister and I were included. And this is with uh, the paper that obviously was uh, filled out so that we could start our journey. And uh, it must have been very painful for my mother to do this. Heartbreaking as it was for the parents, uh, they wanted to rescue their children first and foremost. So they handed them over to strangers rather than uh, endanger them by keeping them with them. There's a tendency to, to think that you can protect your children by holding them close, you know, and keeping them under your arms. But in a circumstance such as that war, that instinctive reaction may not be the wise one. My mother had died somewhere along the way. It was very difficult for my father to talk about his wife's death. The Vichy French would not let parents leave. They couldn't take us out. 
here you are, eight years old, you, you don't have your mom and dad. Uh, come on now, I mean, you know, this is very difficult for a child. And it has different effects. It had a different effect on my brother as it did on me. I can see that, when, how difficult it would be for a parent, uh, a father who lost his wife and put his two children on a boat and with the likelihood that he would never see them again. And my brother, he was torn up and so was I, but somebody had to stand up, so I stood up as best as I could. You go into a new land, new language, uh, it's devastating for a child that age. Father said, read, write, and study, and become a doctor. They can take everything from you, but not your memory. I must have not wanted to go to America. So I don't think I was told very much ahead of time. My mother just packed my things. Martha gave us all beige berets, and there are pictures of us in, in those beige berets. Mrs. Sharp had decided on the berets as a way of recognizing all the children. Yeah, I'm, I'm the tallest. <laughs> I've done that in 66 years. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, all right. And we were on a boat called the Excambian, which was later sunk. Fortunately, not with us on it. What they did was make the ballroom into a dormitory. They just put mattresses on the floor. The boys and girls were separated by a curtain. I do remember being told that we were called when we arrived, the two tigers on that ship. We apparently misbehaved on the ship. I remember seeing the Statue of Liberty. The best Christmas gift I ever got was being brought here, in this country. We arrived in New York, and some Red Cross ladies had a table with cocoa. And that was really very welcome. It made us feel that America must be a great place. The American liner Excambian arrives with child refugees from Europe, youngsters scarcely able to believe they're free from the terrors of war. Triply joyous are the 13-year-old Diamante triplets. Dear American, we are very happy that you are here, and we are very grateful that you was coming to America. Where do you come from, Teresa? From Ken. Were you there during the war? Yes. Tell us about it, Teresa. Uh, it was very bad. We had not enough to eat, and my parents sent me to America for my health. I come from France and I saw lots of misery. There was anything to eat and there was lots of bombardment in Marseille and I, and I saw lots of people killed. What I owe Martha is my life in America. Uh, perhaps my life itself. The, the Strasser family would not exist if we hadn't been on that ship. She said that anybody would have done that. I, I don't think so. No, no, no. Only a special person would have done that. Would have left their own children and gone and taken care of other children.
and we're back. Welcome back to the live stream. For those of you just joining us, we're coming live from NYC. We just watched a couple of clips of the Define the Nazi film. I'm Kerry McDonald with the Unitarian Universalist Association, and we're just getting started with our panel discussion. Here we go. Since 1940 uh, in our work, and it is a great honor for me uh, to be here and to facilitate a panel discussion uh, on the questions that this film uh, raises for us uh, today. Um, Reverend Sharp uh, declared to his uh, congregation in Wellesley, Massachusetts, uh, a declaration of war on evil. And he said to the congregations, what shall we do? What shall we do in light of this evil? Well, they had an answer for that question. But that question rings true to us today as we face the greatest refugee crisis that this planet has seen since World War II. 65 million people who have lost their homes, 21.3 million refugees outside of their borders looking for a place to go that is safe, half of them children. And what we have in this country right now is a dark cloud over all of us in this extraordinary election year in which the voices and forces of xenophobia and fear shout out and create a very caustic political environment so that even our friends who are in public office or running for public office are told by their posters, don't touch this issue. Don't engage in debate by those who are pushing the fear and xenophobia. It, you can't win. You can't win. So on the one hand, we have the fear and xenophobia spreading daily across the media in this country. And on the other hand, we have silence. We have silence. This is a call, this film, this story, this mission of the Sharks is a call to conscience for each and every one of us. Now more than ever before, we need to stand and speak and stand and act to confront the horrible crisis that we're facing today around the world and yes, here in this country. And I'm not being partisan with this. Even our own government, right now, under these circumstances, is engaged in one of the largest mass deportation programs ever of refugees. An expansion of family detention of those seeking asylum larger than ever before. I was at the Berks County Detention Facility in Pennsylvania two weeks ago. And I met mothers who were on a hunger strike to protest the conditions that they're forced to live in. Psychologists have written uh, documentation, provided documentation on the dire effects that this long-term detention is having on these children. Toddlers, I saw, running around this detention facility. And a young mother who I was speaking with had her six-year-old daughter came in the room and crawled on her lap, cute as a button, snuggled with her mom, and her mom told me that this was her sixth birthday, her daughter's sixth birthday. And it was the second birthday that she had celebrated at the Berks County Detention Facility. That's going on right now with our current government in this atmosphere. And while we are uh, congratulating the government for taking in 10,000 Syrian refugees, our neighbors to the north take in three times that many. And we have a population nine times as large and a GDP four times as large. And when things like this happen, crises occur. In Lebanon, one of every, 25%, one of four people are refugees. If the same number of refugees came into our country as is going into Lebanon because of a failure of the world to act, there would be 80 million refugees here in the United States from that conflict. Think about it. Think about it. And this is our watch. And Reverend Sharp asks, what shall we do? What shall 
we do. I'm honored to have with me this, this afternoon uh, three people that have a clear answer to that question. They, they have been speaking and acting uh, in response to that question for their, their lives and careers. Ruth Messenger, um, to, my, to our far left, needs no introduction here uh, in New York, a, an extraordinary political career. Ruth has been speaking truth to power for, for many, many years. She has just ended a remarkable 18-year tenure as the president of the American Jewish World Service. She is now their first ever global ambassador, and it's terrific that she's here. Adam Carroll is to her right. Uh, he is a New York Irish Muslim who has worked on civil and human rights issues around the world for more than 15 years as a founder and director of numerous NGOs and community-based organizations. He currently serves as the New York director of the Burma Task Force. And Sana Mustafa uh, is a student and an outspoken advocate for refugee rights and women's empowerment. Herself a refugee from Syria, Sana and her family took part in the 2011 Arab Spring Movement for which they faced brutal persecution from the Assad regime that eventually forced them to flee the country. She, has, she came to the United States in 2013. She's currently a student at Bard College. So I asked the panel, starting with Ruth Messenger, what shall we do? quite seriously. Um, we don't have much time with all of you. So I just want to say the first and most critical thing to do is to watch this entire film tonight. It's incredible. But before you sit down um, to watch it, email everybody you know and tell them to turn on PBS and to watch the film and then to understand, as Tom has said so clearly and as the film says for itself and as Ken said earlier, this is a call to action. And then I think it's really important that we start telling all of these stories. The story of the Sharps is just extraordinary, but what's most extraordinary to me is that if it hadn't been for Artemis's work and for Ken picking up on this, these are, they are among the many people whose stories we didn't know. And unless you know these stories, or let me put it differently, I think only when you hear these stories of individuals who have stepped forward do you become more able, that's what I would say, to ask yourself that question, what shall we do? I can tell you infinite stories about other rescuers because I've made it my business to learn about them, but I didn't know about the Sharps until I started hearing about this film. So the question, what shall we do, then turns into a question of public policy advocacy. And in a sense, if we were in Canada right now, it would be easier because Canada has accepted a large number of refugees and is looking with individual congregations of all kinds of denominations to welcome families, to pair up people, to make those connections. We don't live in Canada. This 10,000 number, with all due respect, is ridiculously low. And this is a matter of public policy it's a matter for certain, I'm not nearly as scrupulous as Tom, it's a matter certainly at stake in this election. This country's willingness to open its borders, to accept people who need to be, be, to be, need to be able to come into this country, who are seeking um, admission to the United States because of the situations where they live, the places around the world where we as a country, the United States needs to speak out to protect individuals are numerous. As an example, since I know my co-panelists will pick up on this, but American Jewish World Service works particularly with the Rohingya population in uh, Burma or Myanmar, another population discriminated against, um, refugees who quote unquote are being sent back where they came from, which is a totally absurd as Andrew will make clear to you. And we work with another issue, which I'm just going to bring to your attention because these issues are so numerous, um, and that is the effort by the government of the Dominican Republic, a country right near here, um, to expel 250,000 Dominicans of Haitian descent, whom they would like to send back to Haiti. The pe these are people who never lived in Haiti and don't speak Creole. 
we're working on this issue. This is a place, um, both of these countries, Burma and the Dominican Republic, as well, of course, as Syria, where the U.S. has powerful policy options, and we are not exercising them or not exercising them sufficiently. And that will only happen if each of us speaks out, urges other people to speak out, brings this movie to people's attention. I'm just going to tell you one story, because it's very much like the quote from Waitskill Sharp. So I think it will connect to you. There's a book that you might be interested in called Conscience and Courage. It must be about 20 or 30 years old now, written by a woman who lives in New York named Eva Fogelman, who's a psychologist who tried to understand the psychology of the universe of people, not, m not people who did as much as the Waitskills, as the Sharps, but people who rescued and protected people during the Holocaust. And her effort was to understand what makes them tick. And as Ken said before, when she interviewed them, people would say, well, I just did what anybody would have done. And she would say to people, that's ridiculous. You were sheltering people under the floor of your garage or your barn. You were feeding them every day. Your neighbors were not doing that. You were at risk of being turned in by your neighbors. So what you did is not what everybody would do. What made you do it? And it was very hard for people to summon up their own explanation of what motivated them to actually take these risks. But I tell you this story, which I'm sure you've heard before about other people, because Eva then says, when she discusses her book and tells these stories publicly, she closes by saying, when this event is over, some of you will come up to speak to me privately. And you will say, I can't imagine what I would have done. And she said, the question is, what are you doing? I, I guess this, this question of, of what is to be done uh, is always a question. And uh, the dark cloud that was alluded to um, you know, Islamophobia, xenophobia, hate, uh, seems to be expanding. And how does one get out of a habit of defensiveness? I see a lot of my colleagues in the community are constantly de de responding to hate crimes or uh, provocations, uh, whether it's by Mr. Trump or others. Um, and it's been going on a long time. And uh, we see around us uh, beatings and some, sometimes killings of Muslims. Uh, and then there's the overseas situation, which is both distorted and magnified and, and uh, uh, conveyed by our media. And so whether it's the, the next neighborhood over with the bombs in the dumpsters, or it's uh, something uh, going on uh, in Nigeria or Kenya or Iraq, which is usually receiving a lot less play, um, the, the specter of terrorism is real, and yet it is distorted. And so how do we get beyond the politics of fear? And I think that's, that's, that's part of the context of um, Islamophobia, the, the power of, of not just hate, but divisive um, uh, discourse. And those of us with um, uh, a, a, an appreciation of pluralism, and that I think includes most Muslim Americans, uh, very much so, um, uh, uh, are struggling to find our voice in this moment of the dark cloud. This morning I was at a bakery having my morning coffee and I was reading a book by a Muslim, uh, we have a, actually a, an event later at another Unitarian church where a Muslim woman is speaking about her book uh, growing up. It's called Rethreading My Prayer Rug. And I appreciate that opportunity. Those small opportunities do count um, in, in building uh, dialogue. Um, he saw me reading the book, but he didn't want to talk about the book. He wanted to talk about Donald Trump. He said he was a retired principal, but he thought maybe Donald Trump was the best idea for us. You know, that's pretty dismaying. So, uh, you know, I wanted to engage with the, the issues, and usually in those situations I do. And I, I wanted to say that that's one of the things that needs to be done. At that moment, someone came in and distracted us, and we didn't do it. So um, opportunity missed, perhaps, and uh, I may have dropped the ball. Maybe he was the, 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 that one voter that will make the difference. But um, I hope that we can 
you know, step up to the plate. Um, my fellow Muslims uh, during the Balkan uh, wars uh, took in a lot of refugees. Now, uh, it was only in the last few months that we see Syrians arriving, and, uh, but, but uh, on the other hand, in, uh, uh, in Europe, a lot of people, despite Hungary, despite the rise of the right wing and the anti-immigrant uh, politics, there are many people who are stepping up and helping. And uh, I think that's uh, some uh, positive example that we need to know more about and follow. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I mean, what I was watching actually the documentary at, my, at many moments is just related, it was so relevant, I think, to my story or to, Sir to the Syrian story or to any refugee story. Um, and I just, and when she was talking about how um, parents would send off their kids in a boat to the US and even though they are not with them, it just reminded me of what's happening right now when people ask how they could take a boat, how they could risk their kids' lives and take a boat and go to Greece. Well, I think that tells a lot how dangerous it is to stay there. And in the other moment, when she was talking about how they told, how they turned the ballrooms into dormitories, and this is actually the situation now in Germany even. I was in the summer in the camps last month, and literally sports hall have turned into dormitories. Um, so it's not history, I think, it's still present. Um, and this is what's why it's very relevant and it's very important. Um, and I, just, I, got, I got so emotional, I felt, um, I was really, I'm really sad that you know, if I watched this when I was younger, I would feel like that was history, and I would, of course, be mad, like, how did we let it happen? And now I'm, like, at that age, and I feel I'm watching it, and I feel I'm living it, and it's still happening. We are letting it to happen. And I think this is definitely related to your question, what shall we do? I mean, as a Syrian refugee myself, my, my ability here in the U.S. is... Um, building, trying to build social and political advocacy. My, my skill or uh, my weapon is my voice, I think, here in the US. And I've been trying to tell the story, um, and I actually don't like to tell it, to call it even a story, because I think it's, it's my life, it's someone's life, so it's not really a story. Uh, I think a story really detaches it from reality a little bit. And I've, I've been trying to just to speak up to people, to, to all refugees, and just tell people who we are as refugees. And actually, I will share with you briefly who am I as a refugee and why you should not fear me. And I'm sure like here won't be people who fear me, but you should spread the word why you should not fear us and why we are not actually terrorists or, or anything like that. Um, and actually, the story started in something similar in 2011 when the Syrian revolution started. And I come from a very political family, um, human rights family, ever, even before the, actually the war in Syria. And uh, of course, my, my dad, my, my sister, and myself, we took a part in, um, in the revolution. We organized demonstrations, we protested, uh, we spoke um, openly about our opinions against the Assad regime and its crimes and, hu and violations of human rights. As a result, myself and my sister actually got detained in September 2011 uh, for protesting against the government. And uh, eventually we got released gladly, but it was, of course, um, such a horrible experience. And uh, detention in Syria has no rules. It's not legal even. And you, anything could happen to you there. Released a um, few days after. Uh, however, my dad also got detained in a different place, um, on a different case, but also for activism against the government. And he was released almost uh, two months after. So also we were lucky on that. Uh, and actually detention, regardless of this experience being very traumatic, very horrible, actually it did not deter us at all. It was the motivation. And um, I think here comes what you believe in. You just, no matter what, you pay the price for it. And I think this is what your parents did. They believed so much in, in the need of them being there and helping them. And the same for us and my family. We believe so much in our right and freedom and the human rights. And we've lived so much that Syrians deserve much better than what we were getting. Um, so we spoke up for this. And of course, we paid the price. And actually, we're still paying the price. After, after this detention, we continued our activism as a family. And um, eventually, in 2013, actually on July 2nd, um, 
my, my father was uh, kidnapped, it's not even detention, by our own government. He was kidnapped, detained by the most horrible way. Uh, they came to the house and literally turned the house upside down. Uh, they took him in the most violent way without any explanation, without, without anything, just beating him up and, and taking him. And at that time, lucky no one was at the house, meaning my mom, my sisters, or myself. And I actually, I just arrived to the US before his detention a week, one week. And I was supposed to be here on only for two months on one of the State Department uh, training on civic engagement. And I wanted to go back home. And I then just suddenly received a Facebook message from my sister saying that our dad got detained. Eventually, due to his detention, my mom and my 13 years old sister, my 23 years old sister, uh, smuggled to Turkey. They walked to Turkey, fearing for their lives because eventually women get detained when someone's in the family get detained to use them as a political weapons, to use them to put pressure on the men to confess and say whatever they want to hear. Due to, so as I said, they smuggled to Turkey with nothing. And literally, we lost everything due to this. And when they smuggled, they had only their IDs on them. They arrived to Turkey, and like any other Syrian refugees, try, they have been trying to survive. And they are actually still in Turkey. My, my older sister, who was 23 at that time, just only five months ago, she was able to, uh, to make her way to Germany on, alone. So she made her way. She's a refugee in Germany right now. But my 13, who's now 16 years old sister, she's still in Turkey without education for three years now. My mom's still in Turkey with health problems. And on top of that, they are not actually able to leave because Turkey has put on them um, banned. They banned them from traveling because Turkey want to keep educated refugees because my mom wants to go. She received uh, education. And actually, we are not able, I'm not able to go to Turkey due to visa problems. They don't give Syrians visa. And my sister, so even when we fled, it was not over. It actually started another pain in our, in another life, in our, um, another, another pain in our lives. And it's not even over here. You know, I am here and I had to go through a whole different struggle, t trying basically to survive was nothing. I arrived to, to, New York, to, to, to DC actually, not in New York, and I just also was with nothing. I was not prepared, I knew no one, and I was the first to be in my family, two sides, to make it ever to the US, or maybe, maybe even in my village. So it was such a big struggle, and I just made it my first year and a half just because of people's support here. And I, I'm, over, I'm always overwhelmed by people's love and support here, and that's why it breaks my heart that now um, that only a few mem number of Syrians are making it here because actually the community is pretty much welcoming. Of course, there is the xenophobic rhetoric that we see, but I think it's really very small percentage comparing to the others. And I literally moved in 13 places in couches actually in a year and a half where people do not know me, opened their doors and hosted me. And my first host family ever that literally took me from off the street was a Jewish family. And I, like, we're now like families. And eventually, after a year and a half, I was able to survive and was offered scholarship and I'm continuing my education. But from here, my, the only thing I can do, not only to my family, to, any, to all refugees, is literally just telling you who we are. Just get to know us because it's so surprising for me that so many people have never like, met a Muslim sometimes, never met an Arab, never met um, a refugee, don't know, they, they have just the wrong, even all the wrong uh, ideas about how you come to the US even as a refugee. They think you just get out on a boat and through the, uh, through the ocean and come here. Well, it's not Europe, you know, you have to go through a very, very long um, security screening process. And, you know, the, we, when we come here, I mean, we thrive. Uh, I think I'm contributing to the community as much as I'm taking right now. and. Um, you know, our, uh, still like I'm pretty much more stable now being here in the U.S., but I still have a whole family that waiting for stability. I have a sister who's waiting for education, and I have a father who I don't know if he's alive until this moment. So what shall we do? I think I'm, I know what can I, what I can do from here. I'm gonna keep speaking up. I'm gonna keep telling the story, and I think every one of you should think of your resources and think about what can you do.
It is obviously so important for people to hear voices like Sana's voices, and there are voices around this country that Americans need to hear, the voices of those who have come seeking asylum, who have lived this horror. We need to hear these stories, and we need to see this film, and we need to talk with each other, and engage each other, and mobilize each other into, into action. For those of you who are looking for specific things that you can do, we welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. We're working on several practice, and if you were to go to our uh, site, uusc.org and family detention, you could sign that uh, open letter to the president, and we encourage you to, to send that on to others. We're also on the front lines of uh, the issue of uh, dealing with the crisis in, in, in the Burma, uh, in Rakhine State with the Rohingya uh, ethnic minority, with the LGBT community uh, facing tremendous hardships and horrors in Uganda and other places in, uh, in Africa, and those who are suffering greatly from the effects of climate change, those who are on the front lines, those who had the least to do with climate change but are suffering the most from climate change, including losing their home and losing everything, are all part of this story and are all looking to us who, just by coincidence and, and uh, by accident really, happen to be living in a country that has probably the, the greatest influence on the world of any country. So it makes a special obligation for all of us who happen to live here uh, to act. Uh, let me just ask one final question. We don't have much time left, about five more minutes, but let me ask the panelists, from this film and from what you've heard and in your life, what gives you hope? Um, I also uh, felt that I needed to speak a little bit more uh, about Burma as well. Um, I, I'll, I'll address hope, but also false hope. Um, Today, in his powerful uh, speech, uh, President Obama at the uh, U uh, UN summit uh, mentioned the Rohingya, but not by name. And up to now, he's been mentioning it by name because the government doesn't even want to say the word Rohingya. And it's, so it's, uh, they're trying to delegitimize them. Uh, so again, I see that he cares, but he is being diplomatic, quote unquote. Um, and again, we see that this past week, uh, U.S. dropped all its sanctions, not just a few, but all of them, which means that the uh, 100 corrupt uh, generals and, and uh, Burmese uh, authorities are now okay to do business with. Uh, so we have to wonder why are these things being done besides Aung San Suu Kyi's recent visit to China. Um, and I think that there's, this is done for business reasons, and we have to uh, be very clear that we don't want business to be prioritized over human rights. Development is important for peace, but human rights must go along with it. And that's what the whole uh, sustainable development goals should be teaching us, that they're interrelated. And one doesn't get completed and perfected before the other. So as far as hope goes, I mean, I think false hope, you know, that we're already um, solved the problems of the Rohingya, but they're still in concentration camps. They're still stateless, and hundreds of thousands are dispersed throughout Southeast A Asia and in the camps that, that HAWS is helping to fund uh, programs in. And so this is not over. So what gives me hope? Awareness, human awareness, the capacity to self uh, to be cr for critical thought, uh, basically human potential. I think that if we're honest with ourselves and we keep asking questions about our own uh, identity and identity politics, our our preconceptions, we can keep our religions honest, we can keep our lives honest, and we can keep our politics honest. So I, I hope that will bring us hope. Uh, so I want to um, echo what you just heard on every count about Burma. If you go to the AJWS website, which is AJWS.org, um, there are t take action options both on um, uh, Burma and the Rohingya and on uh, the Dominican Republic. Um, so there's lots to do. What gives me hope, I want to add on two different dimensions. One is the broad dimension, and that is that I'm privileged to work with 500 grassroots organizations in 19 countries around the world where people are struggling for their own visions of justice. Um, and we're privileged to help them, but there are leaders in situations over and over again that frankly most of us can't imagine. 
fighting for better policies, better circumstances, and expansion of rights, and they give me hope every day. But also I want to say, you give me hope, because you're here. You each have the capacity, literally I meant what I said before, to reach 40 people tonight with an email. You can get 40 names up there and tell people to watch this film. The film will be shown again and again. I'm sure there'll be possibilities for renting it and pursuing action. But it rests on our capacity to go out there to ask ourselves, what shall we do? What, I, what can I do to make a difference? And then to follow through and to do it. So one last note at the end of, Ken said this before, but at the end of the amazing film that Artemis and Ken put together, you see many of the people who are in the film, some of them you saw already, and you get to hear what they're doing now because they were rescued by the Sharps. That's very powerful. Equally powerful, I want you to remember when you see them, is that virtually every one of those people is a progenitor, uh, that is, has children, has grandchildren, who would not be alive who would not be alive if Waitskill and Martha Sharp had not acted. So about 25 years ago, New York City, when I was privileged to be in government, honored another person like the Sharps, whose story is also worth telling. His name is Chiuni Sugihara. He was the Japanese ambassador to either Latvia or Lithuania, I can't remember right now. And he issued visas to thousands of Jews fleeing that country against the wishes of his government and was then sanctioned by his government and died in disrepute. But 25 years ago in New York City, a town hall, a committee organized to uh, give an award to his widow and his son posthumously um, in his name. And during that town hall event, this is like 25 years ago, so before total social media wireless communication, the MC said, before we end this event by actually giving the award, we believe that some of the people in this audience that we reached out to are who were rescued by and when they raised the lights, there were 400 people on the stage in town hall. So everyone that Chiuni had rescued who heard about this event came with his or her children and grandchildren. And that's what it means to save a life. So in the honor of the Sharps, see what you can do to save a life. It's a very hard question, <laughs> but um, I mean, I would definitely echo you. I think you give me hope and being here and seeing um, the love and support and people who care and ask, what shall we do? Just the fact that you can ask. So that gives me hope and um, I mean, definitely what makes me wake up every morning is just the motivation um, that I hold in my heart from my dad and my, and my other Syrian fellow and all around the world. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for um, joining us today. I'd like to thank the congregation for uh, opening and hosting this, uh, this event. I want to thank Ken Burns, and I certainly would like to thank Artemis uh, who is here uh, with us for this enormous, enormous contribution uh, that you have made. We are greatly indebted to you. We are greatly indebted to you. Well, first of all, I wanted to say what an honor it is to be here today and to share the conversation with you four. You four give me hope, so thank you for your inspiration, your courage, and standing up to, to what is not just an evil in, instinct in humanity, but is a blindness. And part of the Unitarian mission, I think, is to wake our hearts up, not just with the right policy, but with the right human intention to help others. So thank you for inspiring me. And I have the privilege um, to share some very special news and to honor a family that, like the Sharps, uh, were inspired to devote themselves to others uh, and left with their family, uh, literally, and uh, instead of leaving their family behind, took them with them, which I think is kind of 
the new innovation on the SHARP model. Instead of leave your, your, your children be home, take them. And we are honored. Our production team um, two years ago decided that we weren't just satisfied with the film. Uh, we wanted to honor and support rescuers today, and particularly the rescuers who just out of the goodness of their heart rose up and did something for others. And that example is really what my grandparents teach for me. And I think the Woodhouse family, if you could all come up for a minute and uh, receive the second Sharp Rescuer Prize, which gives me so much hope and so much joy to, res to give this to you. This is um, a little memento of our appreciation for your courage and your beauty and what you did in Lesvos uh, as a family. So thank you so much and it's an honor, it's an honor to, um, to, to thank you in this manner. So well, uh, thank you very much, Artemis. Uh, thank you. I want to just say uh, how grateful we are for you, your labor of love to lift up Unitarian Universalist history, to make a work of art, and to call us to our moral selves. Uh, we are eternally grateful for what you've done, and our whole family is indebted to you. And you gave us an opportunity to walk the walk, and for that we're very grateful. I just I have prepared some remarks. Uh, uh, our family is honored and humbled to be recognized by the Sharp Rescue Foundation for our humanitarian missions to Greece. We are a close family and this effort brought us even closer together. Each one of us brought forth the unique skills, talents, commitments, so that we, we might successfully deliver aid to desperate be human beings in need. As is always the case, we are stronger together than as individuals. Last winter, acting together, and on behalf of our donors, we were able to clothe, feed, shelter, care for, and comfort travelers crashing ashore on the island of Lesbos, Greece. We returned to Greece in August to work in military camps where there's now 60,000 refugees stranded, waiting for the world to recognize their humanity. Yesterday, the military camp on Lesbos was burnt down. This is a camp that we volunteered uh, in, and according to the BBC, it was started by one man yelling, freedom, freedom, freedom. And that call was raised by 2,000 people, and they burnt the place down. And so now they're homeless again, but they're not confined to the misery imposed upon them. Um, we've tried as a family our very best to pass on the simple gift of love, person to person, face to face, hand to hand. For this privilege, we are very grateful. The Woodhouse family accepts this honor knowing that we qualify in one respect. Like the Sharps, we begin as very ordinary people. We can only hope that our lives will exhibit, in some small measure, the extraordinary qualities of Martha and Waitzel Sharp. To this end, we dedicate our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to say we're missing two of our kids. Uh, they're both in California, Sarah and uh, three, Sarah and Alexandra, and also our daughter, um, Sophia. Right. Um, I'm humbled. It's an honor that 10 years ago, when we, through the service committee, we were the regional coordinator for the service committee, that we met the amazing grandson of the Sharp and saw the movie. At that time, it was called The Hero of the Spirit. And the movie told the Sharp stories, and then we connected it to the genocide of Darfur. And I and Colin were totally taken away by these were our Unitarian minister and his wife. And they did the heroic work. We were so inspired that we said we will not sit still. And we did whatever we could to reach out to humanity in many different ways. And of course, last year, with Alan Kurdi being washed to the shore in Turkey, we looked at each other and we said, this is what's happening to humanity out there. 
history is repeating itself. And once again, we are required. I call, I'm proud to be a Unitarian Universalist. First, I'm proud to be a daughter of a refugee, an Afghan American, American of course, for, I've lived here longer than I have lived in Afghanistan, but my birth country is Afghanistan. And I could very much relate to Sana's story, and I appreciate, thank you very much for that. The, it's not a story as she calls it, it's her life. These are lives that I have lived, that she's living, that many, many people, at least 2,500 people that I met during the first trip and the second trip, and I speak their languages and relate to them and took their stories. They're living it right now, folks. So I call on my Unitarian Universalists, on all Americans, to please do not sit still. What we shall do is reach out in your own wonderful, heartwarming ways that you always do. America is far than Europe, but we must create education and awareness of this massive crisis of refugees and these beautiful children dying in the agency. So that's what Martha and Wastel Sharp inspired us. We're trying to walk in their shoes, and our hope is that many of you will join us with this effort and do the justice work that's required of us today in the atmosphere and the time that we're living right now in our country. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming. Um, you know, this is something, like my father said, this is something that we did as a family. We are ordinary people. Um, we just decided to take action and, like my mother said, walk the walk. And a lot of that has to do with my own Unitarian Universalist social justice values. So thank you all for coming. And, and again, I hope we can continue to act on your behalf, um, as well as, you know, get some more people involved to join us along the way. So thank you. She pretty much uh, uh, said everything that I was going to say, but uh, I had about, I had two weeks where I went over to Greece and we visited Lesbos, we visited Chios, uh, we visited several different refugee camps. Uh, and for me, it was very shocking. It was shocking to see the living conditions, uh, these poor children, um, the, the women and their families, and how they're displaced. Uh, and I'm, I'm a soccer player. I've been a soccer player since I was three and a half years old. And I don't speak the language. And I also thought it was very hard for me to go over there and connect with them. Because, you know, this is a different language. I'm from America, different culture, um, but they welcomed me with open arms. These little children wanted to, to just smile and I put a soccer ball on the ground and we started playing together and we started interacting and then before you knew it, I was in one of the tents with the family and the mother giving me tea and we didn't speak a word of, of English, but we were smiling and they were just saying thank you. and. Um, I, I saw that hope and I saw, you know, that they want a better life. And um, there was uh, uh, one kid who was 21 years old who was in the tent and uh, his family, they were displaced. Uh, I think the, the father was still in Syria and uh, the mother and daughter were in Germany. And he had a black and white notebook and he was teaching himself English by himself just in a little corner, and um, very humble, and I went and I, I talked with him as best I could, and uh, he would write on his, um, his um, Samsung or this phone, and he would be like, hi, how are you? I'm sorry, my English is not that great. But he told me that he wishes he could go back to Syria. He wishes he could go home. And that's what he wants, that's what he wanted. And he's a 21-year-old that, uh, you know, is trying to teach himself English and, and, and trying to educate himself. And I think that's very important, too, is that we need to understand that education is key. 
and with these women and children and families where they are detained in these camps and they do not have education, um, this is a serious issue. And uh, we also, we didn't see a lot of Americans over there in Greece. We saw a lot of Europeans. Uh, and I think that we do need to get more involved and we do need to help and we need to preach uh, you know, the Sharps mission and exactly what we're trying to accomplish as well. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you again for joining us. And please, let's give one more round of applause to all of our panelists and to all of us. For those of you watching at home, thanks for joining us for this live stream of Defying the Nazis and the Refugee Crisis, Answer the Call. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed our amazing panel today and the clips that we had from the film and hearing from filmmaker Ken Burns and from Artemis, uh, the grandson of the Sharps, and from uh, the Woodhouse family, the recipients of the Sharps Rescuer Prize. Uh, be sure to share the video. It will be archived on the UUA's uh, YouTube account. and. Um, we hope that you'll use this as a call to get involved. And here are just two ways that you can do that by visiting the two sponsor organizations of this event, the UUA and the UUSC, who are both doing great work. The UUSC is building a refugee re rapid response network. The UUA has uh, groups and congregations around the country that are uh, defying hatred and fear right now. So please take this as a call to get involved. Thanks so much for your attention today, and uh, we'll see you out there in the world. Take care.